All right, I'm back. After um, a couple of months of taking care of some personal business, I'm kind of anxious to get back after it. I'm Evan Rowell, and this is Critical Thinking about eggs and mushrooms. Okay, while I was searching around trying to find, you know, what I wanted to do for my, uh, for my video on this time, I was looking at uh, some eggs and I had thought to myself, you know, I've done raw eggs, I've done scrambled eggs, I've done cooked eggs, I've done all kinds of eggs, but I had never done hard boiled eggs. Okay, so I thought this time I'd put up, there are three dozen hard boiled eggs here, all cut in half. And... Um, the way that I cooked them was to put them in cold water, covering them with a half inch or maybe an inch of water, bringing the water to a rolling boil, turning the heat completely off, letting them sit for 12 minutes, and then putting the eggs in a ice bath. And that way they peeled fairly easy, and uh, they actually, they, they hard boiled perfectly, okay? And it is the season for plums, and so in this tray I've got plums. I've, I've simply sliced them up um, into about one-eighth um, pieces. I don't know why these two plums here came out um, light-colored like this. I'm not that much of a farmer when it comes to plums and, and that type of stuff. All of these were red. They were actually the black plums, but two of them came out light-colored, and I thought, what the heck, well, we'll go ahead and do them anyhow. And then in this tray... As you can see, I've got um, mushrooms. Now, I've always sliced my mushrooms up whenever I've done mushrooms. And I was looking at this package of these small mushrooms, and I began to think to myself, you know, I wonder what would happen if I tried to freeze dry these small mushrooms whole. And so I went ahead and did that. And as you can see here, um, this tray is half sliced and half uh, whole. And these are the whole ones right here. And... Um, so that's, that's what's going to happen here. I'm, uh, my freeze dryer is primed, it's uh, cooled, it's ready to go. These are going to go directly into the freeze dryer. And here in, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe 30, 33, 34 hours, I'll pull them out and we'll go ahead and I'll try to reconstitute them. We'll see how they came out and uh, we'll go from there. So give me a couple of days and we'll see what we got after these things are completely freeze dried. And we're back. It's uh, been about 28 hours, give or take a little bit. It's not quite as long as I thought it would be. But um, the batch was very, very successful. And uh, if, you, if you stick around to the end of this tape, I've got some things I need to discuss with you, some uh, tips and tricks on how to deal with ice. And, and uh, I want to dispel a few myths, too. But anyhow, those hard-boiled eggs that I was anticipating... They turned out very dry. They turned out very well. However, they turned out extraordinarily fragile. Uh, that first one that I grabbed is <laughs> right here. It, it just crumbled. It's, as, it's almost as fragile as cotton candy. And, uh, but I did manage to get uh, some of them out of there in, without crumbling them up. And if I'm real careful, see, I, I even broke that one. But I'm still going to use that one in the water. We're going to go ahead and try to rehydrate this. And I have some water right here. So let's put this in there and see what happens. Okay. It's floating in there. I've got a yoke in a boat that's afloat in this little bit of water. And it flipped over onto the uh, yolk side, but that's okay. We'll just go ahead and let it uh, rehydrate. Oh, and the mushrooms. I was concerned about dehydrating or freeze drying, I should say, whole buttons mushrooms. And this is what they look like. They come out just absolutely perfect. And if you, uh, the stem came right out of that, I can, I can tell it's absolutely dry on the inside. But let's see what happens when we cut it in half. Uh, it actually crumbles. It does. And, well, so much for that one. But anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and put that half in there, and we'll give it a rehydrate. I suspect it's going to take almost to the end of this video uh, 
to complete its task. But we're going to go ahead and, and leave it in there. Now, um, I, the other thing that I was worried about was um, how I was going to be able to pack these eggs, seeing as how they were so fragile. And I come across this idea of putting them back in the egg carton very gingerly. But that's exactly what I did. And then take a larger Mylar bag. Yeah, they won't fit in the, uh, the normal bags, uh, large bags. I had to use a, a slightly bigger one. It's a two and a half gallon size. And I've already packed one of them up. And the secret to doing this, and it worked out very well because if I shake it, you can't feel anything moving around in there. And at the same time, I vacuum packed it just enough for the um, mylar to wrap itself tightly around the bag without crushing it, and then I stopped and sealed it. And that's what I'm gonna go ahead and do with this one, okay? The mushrooms, well, they're, they're pretty much as they are. They will go in a mylar bag and be sealed and, um, and put into storage. The plums, the black forest plums, did very, very well. They came out and they are just as dry and and they crack like crackers. And here's something else I wanna I wanna tell you, I wanna discuss with you a little bit. There's a lot of people that I've talked to will go, Oh my good lord, look at there, he's putting things in a plastic gallon bag. Uh, yeah, I do this all the time. I need people to get past their paranoia about um, food rehydration and pulling moisture in from the air. Number one, in the right circumstances, it can happen very, very quickly. But that has to be in the right circumstances. If you are vigilant with your freeze drying or your dehydration, whichever the case may be, and you stop the process before the food that you are freeze drying or dehydrating has a chance to sit there warm in um, in regular atmosphere, it will absorb moisture right out of the atmosphere, and it'll do it uh, you know very quickly. I've I've had stuff turn soft after only a few hours, but if you're right there to actually shut things down um, before they have a chance to sit, and then you pull them out, and while the product is still warm, you put them in these plastic bags. Um, these plastic bags will prevent any moisture from getting into the food for two or three weeks, okay? So these are not by any means um, long-term storage. They're not even really short-term storage. They're very short-term storage. I do this quite often because a lot of times I have to uh, freeze dry something and then keep it while I freeze dry something else that I intend to put in the same uh, Mylar bag is, as a full meal. As a matter of fact, I'm working on tacos right now, and that means putting together, um, you know, the, the the ingredients, the meat, the seasoning, the sour cream, the tomatoes, and all of that. And that's taking several batches, and that's a that's in the works. And so I have um, a great deal that I keep that I'm keeping in the uh, plastic bags. But I, as a matter of fact, um, a while back, I found one of these bags that had some uh, dried, I think, chicken in it, shredded chicken. I was using in an experiment, and I put it in the bottom of the box, and I forgot about it. Uh, four months later, I opened it up. I smelled it. It smelled fine. Uh, it was still dry as a bone, and uh, I even went up and rehydrated it and ate it, and it was, it was just fine. Um, being in that plastic bag for over a month uh, didn't affect it at all, okay? So with that, these, the mushrooms were a success story, the plums were a success story, and the eggs, they were a success story in as much as they dried. Like I say, they were very fragile. But um, I think that they are a success story because I did rehydrate one of these um, a little bit earlier. I'm, I'm doing this one just to show you how they turn out. And they do maintain their, that traditional egg or hard-boiled egg flavor. Okay, and that's something that can't be said for uh, raw eggs or, or fried eggs or scrambled eggs or something like that. When I rehydrated this one, it did 
have that egg flavor, which is what you want if you're making something like um, egg salad for sandwiches, okay? It works very, very well. And so you can even hard boil them, freeze dry them, and then crunch them up a little bit if you don't want to keep the whole hard boiled egg shape and uh, package it that way with the intent that you'll rehydrate it later on and use it in egg salad. So with that, if I had that in mind, that's exactly what I'll do. Uh, but other than that, I don't think I'll ever try to uh, maintain the hard boiled egg shape again because I don't think that they will work out if you want to make deviled eggs or something like that. You'll probably end up just crushing them up anyhow. So with that, these hard boiled eggs, uh, they worked out pretty well, but I don't think I'll, you know, make a habit of doing that. The bag, like I said, we're going to go ahead and seal these up. Um, well, I know I'm going to have to wait till later because I don't have any, um, I don't have any um, oxygen absorbers. So with that, that process was somewhat of a success. I was satisfied with the way things turned out. Um, this does have an oxygen absorber in it, a 300 cc, and it's ready for the shelf and it'll last for a very long time. Okay, I took a little bit of break there. Um, I had something I needed to do. It's been about 45 minutes, and uh, I went and got some oxygen absorbers. But first, I want to check this rehydrated egg and mushroom. I'm quite sure that it's done. Okay, so we'll grab a little spoon here. And because this egg flipped over and it's been floating around in water, that white or that egg white is completely rehydrated and it has about the same texture. It's a little more broken up because of the way it was when it was dried, but it's still spongy. It still feels like a fresh um, freeze dried or yeah, a, a, a fresh uh, hard boiled egg. So you give it a little taste. Not bad, not exact. There is a little bit of um, toughness to it. But overall, it's good. If I were to mix that up, and here's the yolk. Yeah, really good. It's got that hard boiled flavor. If I were to mix that up, it would make an excellent egg salad sandwich, okay? So with that in mind, if you really like your egg salad sandwiches, mm, I'm gonna stop right there. Um, this 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 is the way to go. I'm making a mess. Oh well, anyhow. And that mushroom is absolutely rehydrated. I, of course, I knew that that was going to be the case. Here's here's the stem unchopped. It's nice and spongy, and it's perfect. It's perfect. So anyhow. The eggs, that's preference, but um, the mushrooms, I love mushrooms, and uh, they came out just exactly as I would have expected them to be, okay? So, with that, because I have that uh, 300 cc oxygen absorber, I'm going to go ahead and do this. And the, the, I guess the main reason I'm even doing this is I want to talk to you about this handheld sealer. This handheld sealer does an absolutely wonderful job of sealing mylar bags and the plastic bags that these um, oxygen absorbers come in. But there's something that you, if you're going to if you're going to get one or if you have one, you need to understand that I set it at 160 degrees. Any hotter, and it'll melt this mylar. It'll 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 tear it. Um, any cooler, and you won't get a good seal. So 160 degrees, set with a little dial here. And once that green light goes off, it means that the temperature has been reached. But you still want to wait about 15 minutes before you try to seal anything with it, so that the heat evens out amongst the whole bar. If you try to seal it as soon as that green light goes off, what happens is the bar right around where the heating element is gets really hot and the rest of it uh, stays a little bit cooler and so it'll act like it's 170 or 180 degrees so let it sit for a while 
But now that I got that oxygen absorber in there, and I'll show you why I love these things. We'll go ahead and put those eggs in there. Oh, the oxygen absorber fell out. Put that back in there. I'll fold that up a little bit. I found that's the best way to, uh, to keep that edge straight and wrinkle free while I use this sealer. And I like this because it's wide enough to handle a two and a half gallon bag. So I'll put that seal over the hole of it. See if I can get it in there without melting it. Okay, see now that's why I usually don't have this much trouble. I guess it's only because I'm trying to make a video that it's going to give me a headache. Okay. Take it. Put it over it. Clamp it down. It just takes a second. And you have a seal. And that is a really good seal with those eggs on the inside. And then I take my trusty needle vacuum. Anybody that's been following me knows what this is. And I will stick it right in the bag. Just through the top layer. I don't go all the way through the bottom layer. Turn on the pump and you'll watch it pull the air out of there. Okay. And I'll keep pulling it out until it just begins. You can, you can hear it. That's all. Now I could have pulled out enough moisture or enough air out of that bag to absolutely crush those eggs. But I didn't want to do that. So now I'll flatten out that edge a little bit. Bring that around here. Seal it off and we're good to go. This bag will now sit in a uh, storage for 25 years. It'll sit there for a long time. Okay, turn this off. Now with that, I have something I'd like to discuss with you. I want to dispel a few myths. I want to talk about basically the ice that forms inside your freeze dryer. And I want, my, my goal here is to make everybody calm down about how much food they put in the freeze dryer and how thick that ice is when you take the food out, okay? The bottom line here is that that ice is not going to damage your freeze dryer. The um, refrigeration unit doesn't have anything to do with it, okay, other than the fact that it makes it cold enough for it to become ice. The vacuum pump, it doesn't care how much ice is in there. It's going to maintain the vacuum no matter what. So you've got a lot of ice in there. Now I want you to look at this picture. You can see those uh, yellow arrows. It's pointing to where that ice has come to the edge of the lower tray. Now, if you look, when you're doing it yourself, if you look, you'll notice that although that ice is right at the edge of the yellow tray, it doesn't touch it. Okay, and the reason that is, is because that tray is warm and it'll melt the ice before it has a chance to wrap around the tray. Okay, now a lot of people will think, well, gosh, what that means is that it's going to melt the ice and it's going to resublimate and it's going to float around as evaporation and the, the computer is going to read it um, as not being a done batch and yada, 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 and so on and so forth. Nothing could be further from the truth. When that ice gets down and touches or gets really, really close to that bottom tray, it melts, it goes to the bottom of the barrel, it refreezes, never to um, bother the, the cycle again, okay? I've seen ice come out uh, a lot thicker than that, but still, it's a good idea if you do something to prevent that ice from touching that bottom tray, and this works wonderfully. These are two pieces of aluminum, angled aluminum. It's uh, one inch by one inch, and it's an eighth inch thick, and it's 18 inches long, okay? 
So, uh, and you can get this, uh, what you do is you buy a three foot section at uh, most any hardware store. I got this at Home Depot. And then cut it in half and then sand down the edges so you got no sharp edges. But you'll lay this in, look at this picture. You can see where this angle iron is laid in. And you can also see where this angle iron has prevented very efficiently that ice from coming down and coming in contact with that lower tray. So I would recommend this. It, uh, it handles that ice. But still, there's the issue of everybody thinking, uh, erroneously so, that that ice, you know, I, I, I get comments all the time. I'm a member of five different freeze dryer groups on Facebook. And you'd be surprised at how many people will look at that and go, Oh, Evan, you got that much ice in there? I never have that much ice in there. That means you're overloading the trays. And my typical response to that is, uh, so what? I'm overloading the trays. And I would, I would get into discussions and debates and back and forth and everything. So I did something just to prove to everybody that you, it's actually difficult to put so much food in there that you're going to mess with the freeze dryer's operation. It is. I have put um, five quarts of milk. I have put all kinds of weight. And it never hurts anything. I have seen ice that is extremely thick. And it never affects the operation of the machine. Things that affect the operation of the machine are primarily ambient temperature and how well your pump works and how well your refrigeration unit works and how well the unit is sealed up. But that ice inside of there is not going to do anything. It's not going to hurt anything, okay? Um, you really, you can't, the trays are self-limiting. You can't put enough food inside the freeze dryer to freeze dry enough moisture or sublimate enough moisture off of it to overfill um, those sides of the barrel. So I did a little experiment. I took four large cans of refried beans, which amounted to over seven and a half pounds in two trays. And I took two three pound tubs of sour cream and I put them in two trays. And here's a picture of them. Of course, this is a picture after they've been freeze dried. And the only special thing I do is I'll take a butter knife and I'll make um, those little grooves up and down, cutting it into sections so that you have more surface area and it will freeze dry more efficiently. But you know, I took that out. And when I took it out, look at this picture. That's the most ice that I have ever accumulated in a single batch that that's actually pretty heavy but it still didn't affect the batch it still didn't do anything um, people seem to think when they when they think of uh, freeze drying they think of the food going into the freezer or into the barrel freezing and then when the vapor sublimates off it comes in contact with that steel inside barrel and and then condenses and freezes and that's exactly what happens in the beginning, but it doesn't take very long for that vapor to form an ice sheet on the inside of that barrel, okay? But that doesn't change anything. The moisture still sublimates off the food. It still floats around in there because there's no air movement. Remember, by this point, the vacuum pump is not pulling any air. It's just maintaining the vacuum. So there's no air pulling moisture into your pump that's not already there. But anyhow, even with a thick layer of ice, the moisture from the food, any that still needs, still needs to sublimate off, is going to sublimate off. It's going to float around inside your barrel until it comes in contact with the ice sheet. And the ice sheet is cold enough that the uh, vapor will condensate on it and it will immediately freeze. So there's really no argument about, oh, wow, there's too much ice or you're overloading your trays. I still subscribe to putting no more than two and a half pounds of food in the trays because of the amount of time it takes to freeze dry it, okay? Um, however, yeah, as you can see with, this, with these refried beans, as a matter of fact, I've got them right here. Um, these are four packages of refried beans. They are absolutely dry. And then here are four packages of sour cream.
okay? These I put in uh, packages like this because I'm going to use them um, in a future video, probably my next one, where I talk about doing tacos and tostadas and being able to package them like this without damaging the taco shell or the tostada shell. So anyhow, um, if you look at this picture, you'll see that little tiny button in my hand. After all of that, after the food was completely dehydrated, and it took a long time, it did take over uh, 43 hours total uh, to complete it. And when I, when I took it out, I found that the, um, the beans were absolutely dry. They were, except for that one little button, and I felt it underneath. I could feel the cold spot. And so I poured it into a pan. I sifted through it. And by golly, I found it. And uh, normally, I'd have, that little tiny button, I wouldn't have cared about it. I um, would have went ahead and packaged up the, the beans anyhow. But because I did find a button, I went ahead and put it in the freeze dryer or in my dehydrator. You can see the picture here. I left it in there for two hours. I took it out while it was still warm and put it in these bags. And that's pretty much like sand in there. There is absolutely no moisture. So when people tell you that a freeze or a dehydrator will leave one to three percent moisture in food, well, I don't want to insult anybody, but they're just wrong. Okay, freeze dry or dehydrators have been completely 100% drying food for as long as there's been dehydrators. That's what it does. You leave it in there long enough and it'll dry it dry. Water cannot handle 120 degree temperatures in moving air. Okay, that moving air will carry away that water uh, very, very efficiently. It'll do it faster and it'll do it in, in, with less energy than a freeze dryer will ever be able to do it because the freeze dryer, that last little bit in the center of the foodstuffs that is not frozen anymore, the freeze dryer has a very difficult time making it come out because it may sublimate, but it doesn't actually leave the food so that it can come in contact with the outside or the inside of the barrel and, and, and condense and freeze. So don't worry about that. Please don't worry about that. Just put your food in. Try to maintain 2.5 pounds per tray in a medium freeze dryer. Put your food in there and let the freeze dryer do its thing. As a matter of fact, I had somebody who was doing a little research, and I, I can't remember who it was. Um, he messaged me and says that even at that amount, which was, oh, by the way, there was 18, over 18 cups of water in that ice. Okay, that's how much water came out of those beans and that uh, sour cream. 18 cups, that's a, a gallon, that's five quarts or more than five quarts. And it didn't affect the machine at all. It didn't hurt anything. It didn't bother anything. It didn't change anything. And uh, because I use these pieces of angle iron at the bottom of the tray, you can see at the bottom of the tray where this very effectively stopped that ice from touching that the bottoms and sides of that tray. Um, don't let anybody tell you that there is something wrong with overloading your trays a little bit. Again, I don't recommend it. Um, it, it will take longer to dry. But if you've got a little tiny bit left and you don't want to waste it and you don't want to put it in the refrigerator, stack it on the tray. The only caveat is when you put the tray in, the food must not touch the upper or the shelf above it because there's a heating pad under there. And you don't want that heating pad coming in contact with the food below it. Okay, so uh, again, I, I preach and I preach and I preach about, you know, maintaining food levels and maintaining weights and everything but ice ice is just almost a moot point when it comes to a freeze dryer let the freeze dryer do its thing and then defrost the freeze dryer and and away you go and i want to caution everybody somebody said in um in a message in facebook that they talked with somebody at harvest right and harvest right told them to use a hair dryer if they were going to do a mid-batch defrost. Well, for me, this is an extreme measure. Number one, there's never a reason for a mid-batch defrost, ever. 
just don't do it. You're wasting time, okay? You're wasting energy, and uh, you might even damage the food because you have to take it back out, and you have to put it in a freezer, and you have to defrost your unit, and you have to restart the cycle again. But the idea of using a hair dryer, well, that's just crazy. There's nobody at Harvest Right that would ever recommend to you to use a hair dryer or any other de uh, device that you actually stick inside the barrel or somehow prop it up to, uh, to de defrost mid-batch. Now, I will use a large fan sometimes if I'm in a hurry, and I'll clamp it to the door, and I'll turn off the freeze dryer and plug in the fan and let that circulating air go, and I can cut the defrost time in half. But there's no electricity. You mess up with a hair dryer while that machine's going, and you're just asking for trouble. And there's no way that Harvest Right would suggest doing such a thing. If mid-cycle defrost was ever an issue, Harvest Right would work it into the software and make it so that you can do it safely. But it is not an issue. It's not something that you have to be concerned about. Okay, so be careful what you listen to and who you listen to. People have come back at me and says, well, I read this report, or <laughs> as a matter of fact, in the last year, I've had no less than eight people come back and say, I know what I'm talking about because I've got a food scientist in my family. A food scientist in your family? Really? Come, I, I'm not going to doubt them. But when they're talking nonsense and they say they got that nonsense from a food scientist, come on, give me a break. Most people who get on the internet and they read these reports, they are reading reports of people that are talking about pharmaceutical uh, dehyd or re uh, freeze drying, um, chemical freeze drying, or commercial freeze drying. And I'll tell you what, as a chemist out in a large copper refinery here, in, in my hometown, I deal with water content in the, in the, in the furnace feed and other compounds and, and, and everything, and, and I tell the control room what they're putting into the furnace, which is very, very important. In there, I've got equipment that will measure water content in parts per million. Okay, so when people say, well, I, I read this report, or I got this, you know, they give you a link to some report, and I follow them all, and inadvertently, and almost every time, they're not talking about freeze-drying food, okay? Freeze-drying food is, is a non-issue to these people. They're talking about units, freeze-drying units that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and capable of freeze drying the weirdest things. And they, they do have to be careful about water content that you could not normally see or feel. In other words, water content that is in parts per million. And don't ever let anybody tell you that you cannot freeze or you cannot dehydrate food down to zero because I do it all the time. And if anybody's ever tried to dehydrate peas, from start to finish, they come out looking like shrill, little tiny shriveled up rocks, and they're just about as hard. There's no moisture in there. It, there's certainly not 4% moisture left in there. And that's why Harvest Right, in their recommendations, will tell you. They, 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 will, they will tell you when you pull the food out of a batch, when the batch is done, go to the thickest part of the food, break it in half, and inspect it. Touch it. If you can feel and detect no water, Throw it in a Mylar bag, seal it up, and you're good to go, okay? Don't make it more complicated than that. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. And um, you really, really don't, don't do yourself a disservice by under-utilizing your freeze dryer. It just drives me nuts when I see somebody with a freeze dryer tray and they've got little pieces of apple or something. They got it laid down in one little tiny layer and an inch over. They got another one and an inch over. They got another one. And I look at that tray and I go, my goodness, I'll eat that much in a one sitting. There's, you know, there's just hardly any. And then they come back to me and wonder why their water content is never as much as mine. Okay. So just, just be intelligent about that. Um, experiment. There are things to learn. There are things that you need to know about freeze drying that will help you get the most bang for your buck out of your freeze dryer. So the bottom line is that ice buildup inside of there that you see here 
is of very little concern. The only concern really that you have with ice buildup is its pattern. If all of your ice is being built up at the back of the machine or all of it's at the front of the machine, then you've got a refrigeration unit problem. Okay, but if your ice is relatively even from, you know, very close to the back to very close to the front, then you're good to go. You don't have anything to worry about, okay? Uh, you do have to monitor vacuum pressures and keep a machine clean. I always clean and defrost and clean my machine between every cycle and I change the oil in my oil fill, oil fill pump about every five batches. Uh, it stays that clean. If you clean and take good care of your machine, that's not something you're going to have to worry about. So with that, I hope you've learned a thing or two. I hope that you'll subscribe. I hope that you'll ring or, or click that notification bell and, and uh, tell your friends. Give me, uh, give me a like and, and make a comment. Tell me what you think of what I'm doing here. My next video that I'm working on is, like I say, how to do tacos and how to uh, prepare and package the taco shells so that when you put a slight vacuum on them, you don't crush them. And many people would say, well, well, then don't put any vacuum on them at all. But that means as the bags are shook around and as they're, they're stacked, as they're packed into boxes or something, the shells are going to get crushed anyhow. So you need, to, you need to do something with them so that they're not crushed. I'm working on that. I'm developing a way to do that, and I've had some real success. So stick around, uh, hit the notification bell, and um, I'll see you when I come back. Oh, and one more thing. I am a professional photographer, and uh, you'll see my um, website here somewhere. I'm not sure where I'm going to put it on this, but uh, I really like it when my subscribers go to my website and check out my photography, especially my fireworks and my water drop and my landscape. Um, I'm pretty proud of that stuff, and I think uh, you might be impressed. In any case, I'd appreciate it if you'd let me know what you think. Until then, I'm Evan Rowell, and this is Critical Thinking about eggs and ice.